Maybe you're an attorney thinking about a career shift, or maybe you are still in law school or college and you're thinking about becoming a JAG, a judge advocate general, what we call military attorneys. Maybe you don't know any active duty attorneys to be able to call up and ask all of the millions of questions that you probably have and all of those questions that you don't even realize you should be asking. And maybe you're a bit distrusting of the JAGs that you do find at career fairs because you have this conception that they're just there to sell you on a life. I get it, I was in that exact same position. And I knew well enough before I joined the Air Force that joining the military and becoming a JAG was more than just a career choice for me, but it was gonna require a completely different lifestyle change. So I reached out to as many current and former active duty members that I could find to ask all of the different questions that I had. And while that was helpful for me in trying to understand military lifestyle generally and what I could expect, it wasn't super helpful for me in trying to determine what I could expect as a JAG. And that's just because every career field is different. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about some of the major differences between being a military attorney and a civilian attorney, so that if you are right now trying to make that decision for yourself, hopefully this information will allow you to make a better informed decision. So essentially the way that I'm looking at this is that if I had a friend or a cousin who was thinking about becoming a JAG and they came to me and asked me to tell them in about 10 minutes or so what the major differences are that they should know, this is the advice that I would give them. Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Ashley Noel. Thank you for stopping by. On this channel, we talk about military lifestyles, personal development, and tips on traveling and working abroad. I'll start off by saying this, I do not speak for the Air Force or the Department of Defense. I only speak for myself. Every single military branch does things a little bit differently when it comes to how they administer their JAG program. So I will try to keep it as general as possible and say things that we all tend to have in common just because we all do operate under the same code of laws, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. But if I say something and somebody out there is watching and thinking to themselves, well, that's not the way that we do it in the Navy, it might not be, but it's probably not too far off. Probably the biggest difference between the two, which also I think is kind of the main message that doesn't really get pushed enough when it comes to JAGs, is that in the military, you're gonna be expected to be a generalist. Whereas if you go to work for a civilian firm, usually in the civilian capacity, attorneys niche down into a particular area of law and they tend to stay in that space. So for instance, let's say that you graduate from law school, pass the bar and go work for a firm. Let's say the firm that you work for focuses on immigration law. You're gonna be an immigration attorney or if they focus on criminal defense, you're gonna be a criminal defense attorney. Let's say you take the patent bar and go work for the USPTO. You're gonna be working on patents and trademarks. Or let's say that you want to be a litigator in a courtroom and you go work for your local district attorney's office. Okay, they're still going to niche you down there. In the district attorney's office, they're going to put you in the civil division or the criminal division. Let's say they put you in the criminal division. They're going to put you in property crimes or homicides, you know? So you're always going to have a niche in the civilian world unless you go work for like a boutique law firm or a law firm that does general practice type of law. Then you can be able to focus on more fields of law than a specific niche. But for the most part in the civilian world, World, you're going to niche down. The military is totally different. We are expected to be jacks of all trades and proficient in every area of law. In the Air Force, attorneys spend their first several assignments at base legal offices. And in base legal offices, we practice all types of law all day. So we prosecute cases at court martial. We draft wills and powers of attorney. We advise on divorces, child custody matters, landlord tenant issues, property claims, immigration issues, tax issues. Basically any question that is even tangentially related to the law, we advise on. What's super important about this point is that if you're joining the military and you are interested in focusing on one particular area of law, forget it or at least manage your expectations and realize that 
the military is not going to let you be able to hone in on any particular area of law until you are usually at least a major. And even then, whether or not you get put in an assignment that focuses on that desired area of law, it's gonna be up to higher headquarters and the person working assignments, whether there is a military need for you to be put in that space or if there's a military need for you to be put elsewhere. There are a couple of areas where I've been able to see Air Force attorneys at least narrow in a little bit more on a focus area. And one of those areas involves if you want to be a litigator in a courtroom. In the Air Force, after you've completed one or two assignments in the base legal office, then you can apply to be a defense attorney. After you're a defense attorney, you can apply to be a circuit trial counsel or a circuit defense counsel. So basically, trying cases is your primary job. And then after that, you can apply to get a position as a military judge. So all of those things will keep you in the courtroom for a lot longer than normal. But still, with that, manage your expectations. So yes, if you join the military, you are going to become a litigator immediately and start trying cases, whether that's what you are interested in focusing on or not. But still, even though you go that route and become a defense counsel, don't be surprised if after four years in, you have maybe 30 to 50 cases under your belt. Whereas if you had gone the district attorney route and stayed a civilian, after four years in, you would have hundreds of cases under your belt. You always have to keep in mind that if you go the civilian route and you go to work for the district attorney's office, your primary job is going to be to develop and try cases in court. Whereas if you're in the military and let's say you are a defense counsel, yes, you are still going to be trying cases in court, but you're going to be doing a ton of other things as well. So you're still an officer in the armed forces. With that comes additional duties, additional responsibilities. So don't just think that if you're just a defense attorney and you only want to go that track, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to try cases. That's that's the way you're going to get it done. You're going to have a ton of other things to do on top of trying cases. Space law is another area that I see becoming one of those niche fields where JAGs are able to stay in a little bit longer than normal. But still with space law, typically I see those billets being filled by people who have gotten their LLM in space law. And to apply for an LLM, you're going to have to stay on past your initial four-year commitment. A second point is that in the civilian world, usually attorneys are measured by billable hours, but in the military world, just as with other government attorney positions, we're not measured by billable hours. We're given specific hours during the day that are designated as work hours, but typically we end up spending a lot more time in the office than just those hours. Also, if you're in the military, then we participate in installation-wide exercises, which will keep us in the office on 12-hour shifts, rotating on and off so there's that as well a third point is that in the civilian world you're able to be a lot more geographically stable so you can determine what city you want to live in and find a job in that location in the military we move every one to three years we're able to submit a wish list to higher headquarters for where we would like for our next assignment to be but we really don't have all that much of a say in it and you're gonna go where the military needs you to go ultimately the needs of the military are going to supersede your own personal wants on top of that military members deploy and typically deployments last anywhere from six months to a year so those are just more situations that take us away from our home and we have have military installations worldwide so it is not outside of the realm of possibilities that military members can be assigned to overseas locations and that point about military members moving so frequently and having so little control over where our assignments are going to be next that can be a stressor for a lot of people but i really think that it just comes down to a matter of perspective it doesn't have to be a bad thing so for instance because we have military bases worldwide that means that you have an option to live anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the United States where you have always thought it would be cool to live, you can try to put in for assignment in that geographic space and not have to be there for super long. And maybe if you wanna know what it's like to live in Asia or to live in Europe, then you can ask for an assignment overseas to one of those locations. And again, not have to be tied there for super long. So if you find that you don't really mix well into the culture or the community or the environment of the space, it's really okay because you're only gonna be there for one to three years, so you're gonna leave soon anyway. 
So I think that's just a matter of personal preference, the moving around so frequently. There are pros to it, but there are also cons to it. The last point that I'll leave you with is a pretty obvious one, but one that you should still consider quite seriously. And that is that JAGs do deploy to war zones where we are active participants in combat operations that could result in the loss of human life. Now, of course, we do always act within the law of war and international laws such as the Geneva Conventions, but if after reviewing your conscience, you think that you would have a hard time being able to carry a firearm or take out an enemy combatant, then probably joining the military is not the optimum job for you in any context, unless of course you're joining as a chaplain or somebody in the medical profession where you are not actively engaging in combat operations. So there you have it. I hope this helps you. I am not a recruiter. I am not here to sell you one way or the other. I am just here to provide you with information so that hopefully you can make a more informed decision about this life choice of joining the military as a JAG. If you like this video, if you learned something new, please make sure to hit that like button down below. That helps me know that the information that I'm providing is actually useful to you. If you have any questions about military life or life as a JAG, then please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section down below and I'll answer whatever questions that I can. And also I put out new content every week, so please make sure to hit that subscribe button too so that you don't miss my next upload. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate you being here and I will catch you next time.